Hi, I'm Mike with House on the Mend. And in this video, we're going to be unboxing, assembling, and reviewing this outdoor patio heater by Rougier. So let's get started. If you break it, he will fix it. If you buy it, he will build it. House on the Mend. Yeah. So with fall here and winter coming, this is a perfect time for most people to start thinking about getting some outdoor patio heaters. We have several at our house and we use them for parties and get togethers and they work great and really help to extend the season. Now I'm not sponsored nor paid by Rougier to make this video. Uh, they did reach out to me and sent me this unit free for my independent review. So let's unbox it and start getting it put together. Let's see what's inside. Well, there's the head turned upside down. And if you look up here, I always like to see this in the packaging. This is really nice, rigid foam. A lot better than styrofoam, which if it takes an impact, can just break or dent and stay that way. This stuff, if it gets compressed or jarred, it comes right back to life. So listen to this. So this has a safety feature that if it senses a fall, if it's uh, pivoted one way or the other 30 degrees, it's supposed to shut off to prevent it falling to the ground and catching something on fire. And I think that's what we're hearing there in any direction, some sort of little float or sensor that's moving. So if that's the case, that's gonna be great. We're gonna test that later once it's assembled. All right, as always, I read through the manual first and it's really well written, good English grammar that's easy to understand. Uh, the sun is a little harsh right now because it's on its way down in about an hour or so. The sun will be down, so it's a perfect time to assemble this. The instructions say it should take about an hour and uh, we can fire it up uh, when it gets a little cooler here. We'll be able to see the flame when the sun goes down. It'll be great. All right, uh, you can take care of most everything you need with a 3 8 wrench and a 14 millimeter wrench. Why the two different ones? I, I can't tell you, metric and imperial, but those are the ones that fit the nuts on here best. Uh, I'm gonna be using some Loctite for all the bolts uh, and nuts because not a single nut is nylon threaded. I like to see nylon threaded nuts um, and there are zero in this. So that's kind of a strike in my book. Okay, if you don't have Loctite, you can just use fingernail polish. Just make sure it's not a popular color in the household or you might be in trouble. First thing we do is take the bottom base, turn it upside down, and we're gonna attach the wheels. The wheels are a really nice touch because you can tilt it and then just roll it around on a, a relatively flat surface. These nuts uh, and bolts that come with it have two washers, so a washer on the outside, a washer on the inside. I like to use a little tray like this so that I can dump all my parts out and nothing rolls away. Uh, the kit comes with three very thin metal uh, little braces, and these are meant to go right on the base, on the outside of the base, and they're like little feet that are going to try to help it a little bit from tipping over. So that's a nice little touch to see. These are going to be our little 3 8 ones here. Bolt, bolt. Washer, washer, Loctite, Loctite, nut, nut.
done. So now we flip it over and we're going to put up the uh, three arms that are going to go around the tank and are going to hold this cover in place. So these three support brackets are identical and there is uh, pre-threaded locations for them on the base itself. So you don't have to reach underneath with a nut. Support bracket, Loctite, bolt. I'm just gonna do these hand tight until I put on the pole up here. So if I need to adjust a little bit, I'm able to do that. Once we get that plate on the bottom of the pole um, secured, then I can lock these guys down. The pole has a base welded onto it and there's only three sides to that base and that corresponds perfectly with these uh, three support brackets, just like that. So we've got bolts that will go through that bracket, then we'll go through the very top of the support bracket and they get locked down with a couple nuts. No washers here, apparently. I'm gonna hand tighten these in the beginning and once everything's lined up, I'll, I'll come back. That sun's dropping fast. We're gonna be firing this thing up soon. So since there's two holes, at each point here in the base. I'm gonna tighten those down first, and then I'll come down to the uh, base here and tighten those. Good. These three bolts down here are really close to the side, so I'm just gonna tighten those by hand with a uh, ratchet. One. Two and three. Now we can set the base down on the ground and uh, start building upwards from there. Good thing we took that break to put this down so I could check the camera because I needed to pump up the ISO there. It was getting dark. We've got the base set down. Uh, these are all very flexible little support brackets. So if it looks a little bit um, off to one side or the other, you can easily bend it by hand and get it to the point where it looks pretty plumb. Like, mm, by eye, just so it looks nice when it's all done. Next thing we want to do is slide on this cover because we're about to put the head on it and that's a point of no return. Before I put the head up on the uh, pole here, I do wanna take this ad advantage here while we're down at a nice uh, working level to put in these little reflector spacers. So the big reflector up top is gonna sit on these little guys. I'm gonna put these into what looks like riv nuts right here. Have those already set in place make our job a little easier. One, two, three. On the bottom of the head, there are already installed uh, three little bolts. And they're pre-threaded into the metal here, which is nice. That means you're not, it would be about impossible to get up here with a little bolt, right? So I'm gonna take those completely off because this slides into this. I don't know what the chances are of this label staying on there, having to go all the way down here, but let's try it out. There it goes. Now let's put the head on and let's orientate it right here with the sticker. So anyone who comes up to ignite it sees all the heating operation instructions right here. Uh, right above the controls. Once again, Loctite. Hand tighten until I get all four in. One. 
Yeah, that's why we hand tighten them so that it, there's still a little room to work around in there. Two, three, and four. Next, let's build the reflector that goes up top, the big circular piece. Uh, it includes a full moon piece here for the center, followed by three of these little crescent moon pieces. Now this blue tint you see is really just a protective coating. So we're gonna peel that off. Whenever I deal with this highly reflective stainless steel, I like to put rubber gloves on. That way I'm not delivering a product or enjoying a product at home that has fingerprints all over it. Gloves are on. Boy, that comes off nice and easy. I've assembled some uh, restaurant tables uh, for the back area. They're all stainless steel recently and shelving. And that stuff was almost impossible to get off. Well, I'm really not impressed with this. They put on the uh, blue protective coating and it seems they did that before they crimped this piece right here. And so the blue coating is just tearing off and you can't, you can't get it. Uh, that should have been thought out better. Tearing off that protective cover was definitely the most tedious part of this job. So we're gonna put the first two uh, crescent moon pieces together. I'm gonna do all this hand tight first and then come back once we set it on the uh, inner circle piece. That. What are you doing? Hi. This is Reese, our little rescue dog. All right, last nut going in, all hand tight. There's the three of those. Now let's put that centerpiece on. All right, centerpiece is kind of like a hubcap, so I'm just gonna set it on to one of the bolts. Take the nut, hand tighten it again. the circle just hand tightening everything and till we got it basically assembled. Now, if it wasn't for these gloves I'd have fingerprints everywhere. Now those are all hand tight and secure I can tighten them up. The reflector plate is ready to go up top, but that's a really high lift. So what I'm gonna do is set this guy aside. And my table here has a notch in it right here. I'm gonna turn that just like this. And I'm gonna rotate the heater down right into that notch so it can't slide one way or the other. So that reflector is gonna get put right on these three studs on top of the head that we put on, and they just get tightened down with these little wing nuts. Now, if you wanted to, with wing nuts, of course, you can easily remove them. However, of all these kind of heaters I've ever had, I have never once removed the top. If anything, I laid it down and bent it out a little bit if it got dropped or something like that, but, so I'm gonna, make sure these don't get loose and I'm just gonna pre-treat them with Loctite and that way I won't ever have to worry about them as I'm moving them around that they're gonna get loose. Go. All right. Okay, wing nuts are on. Now I'm just gonna hand tighten them, of course, all the way down. And there we go. 
The unit comes with a little AAA battery for the igniter, and in the manual it shows that the negative side, or the back side of that little battery, goes in first, and then you just simply screw this igniter right back into place. Now from right here, as I look on the, uh, to the right of the igniter, I'm looking up into the unit. I can actually see the little spark producer up there. It's still a little bit bright out, but, oh, I can hear it. Hear that? Nice, so that's not even a click one uh, that produces one spark. This is a repeated spark. That's great. So this little nylon strap comes in the kit and there is no mention of it anywhere in the manual except for one little tiny picture in the bottom corner of page 10. And what I believe it's for is strapping down the propane tank. Uh, there's a little hole right here in the strap itself, but as I looked around inside the unit, so we just lift this up, set it over like that against the uh, plate for this post and it'll stay put. As I look around, there is no hole anywhere to receive a screw for this guy and no screw was included. But I happen to have a drill and a self-tapping screw. So I figure, what the heck, let's go ahead and install it just to be safe and strap it down, the tank down once we get it installed. About right here should be good. Okay. This is a fresh tank. I'm gonna take the little protective cover off, set that aside. I'm gonna pop it right into place here. Push it against that back one so that this strap has some effect. There we go. All right, so this is the pressure regulator and this little guy is the cap that goes right in here for the tank. Turn that clockwise to get it right into place. Just like that. And then this kind of sticks out, so hopefully it won't bang into the top. But the next thing we want to do, test for leaks, I'm just going to use a spray bottle with uh, dish soap and water. And we're going to spray these areas and make sure we don't have any leaks. So here we go. No bubbles forming, so we should be good to go. All right, we're gonna turn the pressure on. Manual says to uh, turn it over to high, press it inward like this. You can hear, if I stop talking, a hiss. That's the gas coming up through here. So after about five, 10 seconds, it says to start hitting the igniter. every so often until it lights. You don't want a large pool of propane up there. I can smell it now, so let's see if we can get it to light. Oh, there we go. Damn. There it goes. <laughs> now, I'm looking in there. Yep, I can see it's going. We're gonna hold it for about another uh, 10 seconds or so, and at that point, ah, see that discoloration going there? We know it's lit. I'm gonna turn it down to the low setting. It says to let it sit there for five minutes to get thoroughly warmed and then you can start adjusting it. So if the igniter ever goes out, there's a solution where you can still use the unit. To the left of the igniter and temperature control, there is this little teardrop metal cover right here with a Phillips screw holding it in place. And if you loosen that screw and uh, move the teardrop one way or the other, there's a hole right there that you can slide a barbecue lighter right up into through that port and you could light the unit that way if the igniter ever fails. 
So as you can see here in the Amazon listing, there is a safety feature that senses if the unit pivots in any direction 30 degrees, sensing a fall, and it should automatically shut off. So let's test that right now. The unit's going, I can see the flame right here, and you can probably hear it hissing away. Let's rotate it. And there it goes, I can hear it shut off. Nice. I'm just gonna go ahead and shut that off because I'm gonna set it back. Good. So look at this. When I uh, tipped it over to perform that safety function, it just simply bent this really weak, flimsy metal foot that's supposed to keep it from tipping over. Look at this, I can just push on it with minimal effort and get it right back into place. So that is not the strongest piece of metal. Well, we've had it running for a bit now on the low setting. Let's go ahead and turn it all the way up to high. And let's see if we can get this guy glowing up here. So there's a burner I can see all the way around. And nice clean blue flame all the way around which is a good sign that means it's being evenly distributed and that it's adjusted properly down here from the factory. If you see a lot of orange flame coming out of your barbecue grill or something like this, you'll know it, it's not adjusted right. Yeah, that's getting golden orange, isn't it? So it's been about seven minutes and that's a pretty good glow there. So in the Amazon listing, there's two conflicting slides. One of them says that this can put out heat up to 108 square feet. The other one says that uh, 8 to 10 feet radius, it has uh, heat that is comforting or something like that. So 10 feet radius is like 78 square feet. You can see I did the math. So, well, I'm not sure which one's correct, but let's see if you can notice a heat difference at 10 feet, because that's easy. So I got a tape measure here, 10 feet away, I got an Adirondack chair, nice and low where you tend to sit and enjoy outdoor events. And I've got a metal shelf here that is 64 degrees. Let's leave it sitting here for 10 minutes and I'll come back and see if there's any noticeable difference in the temperature of this shelf. All right, 10 minutes is up. Let's see what the difference is. <laughs> it's actually 60.8, so it's dropped almost four degrees. So uh, it is not making a difference at 10 feet. All right, that's quite a claim and it can't be substantiated. Let's cut that in half. And let's see if we get any better than a four degree drop. All right, this metal shelf is at 10 minutes at 10 feet, 10 minutes at five feet. Let's see if there's any difference. All right, 66 degrees. So it went from uh, 64 degrees back there to 66 degrees here. So there is a difference. Now, I will say as I walk around here, I'm six feet high, I can feel the heat. So most of the time when we're entertaining guests, we have folks standing around uh, these heaters when it's cold out. And then we have a small like tabletop one that we'll put at the center of like our outdoor patio table. And those tend to, to work really good for folks that are sitting down. But I would say if you're sitting right here, you're probably not feeling much difference when you consider it's 57 degrees on our uh, raised bed over here. So yeah, what, nine degrees difference? That's not so bad, but right here, uh, it feels great. The, the bottom of this right here is 100 degrees. And it's not even hot to the touch, but it's 100 degrees. And when I stand right here, it's very comfortable. So it's, it's working just the same as all the other ones we've ever owned. All right, so we're pushing the limits of this camera's ability to capture uh, much because it's getting dark out. So let's go ahead and 
uh, turn this guy off for the night. I'm going to reach in the little hole and I'm going to turn off the tank. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to turn this guy, I push it in and turn it to the off position. And you hear that clicking? That's just all this real thin metal just starting to relax. Not an issue, all of them do that. Want to know what this shiny pretty thing's going to look like in a couple years? <laughs> It'll look just like this. Still works good, but quite faded. And it'll look like this if it ever falls over. So if you found this video helpful, will you please give it a thumbs up? It really helps the YouTube algorithm to start suggesting it to more people. And I appreciate all of you that have done that for me in the past. Also, please consider subscribing. I work really hard to put out good quality content and there's more videos to come. I wanna thank the folks over at Rougier for sending me out this unit. It is a great little unit with the exception of the weak metaled feet and the lack of uh, nylon nuts. Uh, they did a great job on it. This is going to be very similar to any other outdoor patio heater that you purchase. I'll leave a link to this one since you know exactly what you're going to get in the comments below. Uh, full disclosure, that's an affiliate link. So if you click on it and end up making a purchase, it won't cost you a thing, but I do get a small reward at the end of the month. It helps to justify the time and the effort it takes to make these videos. For example, the uh, infrared uh, thermometer that I used to run the test was purchased with uh, reward money. So thank you for all of you that have done that in the past. Until next time, thank you for watching.